vehicle, even though the two vehicles are like, how far apart are they really? Sure. Yeah. So I grok you. No, because up here, Forster's also ran out fast. Okay. And so sure. yeah, the only reason, the main reason I have an Outback is because that was the one I was actually going to be able to get negotiate on <laughs> because they actually had the Outbacks available. And hi, everybody. If you're wondering, no, the session is not about uh, Subaru Outback versus Subaru Forester. Though, if you want to get in the debate, you're more than welcome to join us and chime in uh, in the q and in chat. That's perfectly fine with us, actually, in all seriousness. But I'm pretty sure you're actually here for a very different reason. In this case, it would be the D3L2 session. Uh, so, Carly, you've got the YouTube, the LinkedIn all set up. Why don't you take it away? Awesome. Welcome everyone to today's D3L2 session. I am Carly Akerley with the Linux Foundation. Today we have Andy Grove and today's session is titled Discussing Rust Ballista Ray SQL Data Fusion with Andy Grove. So just so you know, uh, Andy Grove started the Data Fusion and Ballista Curie engine projects and donated both to the Apache Software Foundation as part of the Apache Aero project. He also donated the initial Rust implementation of Apache Aero and recently created Ray SQL, a distributed SQL query engine in Python using Ray. I also want to give a friendly reminder that Data and AI Summit is one month away, June 26th to 29th. From now until June 2nd, you can use a $400 off promo code, ETLinux400, which I will place in the chat. And without further ado, I will pass this over to Denny to kick off today's discussion. Perfect. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Carly. Really appreciate your time. Uh, before uh, we get into the groove, I just want to call out, start asking your questions uh, in whether you're attending via Zoom or via YouTube or via LinkedIn. We already have some questions from LinkedIn, which is funny. So this is awesome. So I want to give a shout out to Jonathan Bird for, for chiming in already. But before we do that, let's definitely do what we typically do in these D3L2 sessions, which is let's talk to our guest in this case, as Carly noted, it's Andy Grove. So Andy, why don't you start off and tell a little bit about yourself, like where you're currently working, uh, like what you're currently doing. And then I want to actually afterwards go back in time a little bit and talk about like, how did you even get here? But let's start with the more obvious thing. You know, what are you doing right now? <clears throat> sure, yeah, awesome. So my day job right now, I work for NVIDIA, which is a great company to work for. Um, I work on the Spark Rapids project, or more formally, the Rapids Accelerator for Apache Spark. And basically... It lets you run your Spark SQL and ECL jobs on GPU to make them go faster and you know, cheaper to run. So that's pretty cool. And essentially, we're mapping Spark's physical plan to operations in the QDF library. So QDF is a Python C++ library for performing days of frame operations on the GPU. So that's, yeah, that's basically the, what, what I do kind of nine to five. Gotcha. And and incidentally, I think the stuff that you're doing nine to five did help your company stock explode yesterday. Right? <laughs> so the timing is very apropos, right? <laughs> yeah, it's been, pretty, right. it's been pretty crazy watching that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's really nice. Okay. But we're not here to talk about that, though, as interesting as that is, or talk about Super Outback versus Forrester. So that's also an interesting conversation. No, no. Uh, what? How did you get involved in this in the first place, Andy? Let, let's like dive in, go, sure. go back in time. Like, are you like a, like we, we were laughing in the background of how we're both introverts originally, which is hilariously funny that we're both on a podcast right now. But um, like, yeah, how did you get into like programming? Were you always a programmer or were you doing something else? I'm just curious. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I have to go back kind of a long way to the, uh, uh, I guess, 1980s. So when I was a kid, um, <laughs> my, um, I got interested in programming around the age of 11 or 12. Um, so I grew up in England. We, um, my parents sent me on a kind of mini, it's kind of like a summer camp. It was just like a week long thing at my local library in a little village in Essex. And um, I learned about computer programming and I thought it was kind of neat. Um, yeah, a bit later, I, I got my own computer, a Commodore 64, and I just started, yeah, like teaching myself stuff. And I thought it was really cool. And I decided then, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. So that's like the really early start. Um, so then, yeah, fast forward a bit, you know, I, I got a job. 
I've been a software engineer like forever, uh, 30 plus years. Um, that's what I've always done. <laughs> um, but, where, but, but where this chapter really starts is about 15 years ago when I, I moved to the US to join the startup and we were building a database sharding product. Um, so if you don't know what database sharding it is, so at, at that time, it was really difficult to scale up on Amazon AWS. The servers only had so much memory, so many CPUs. And it was around the time that Facebook games were becoming popular. So developers would build a game like PHP, MySQL. It would work great until it went viral and too many users came along and it, you know, they just couldn't scale. Um, so sharding kind of emerged there as one of the solutions. So instead of having one database, you know, why not partition your database into multiple instances and then you know, send your query to the appropriate database based on where your user data is. That's essentially the idea. Um, so I joined a startup, uh, we had a product called DB Shards, and we built this kind of middleware like JDBC drivers, um, like some query servers. So we would make the distributed database look like a single database. That's basically the idea. So that's that's where I started learning, I guess, about like distributed queries and passing SQL and all these um, different things. And then from there, I moved on. The company kind of evolved and transitioned. And then we started building a streaming SQL database for a specific industry. And this is around the time that Apache Spark had started. Um, so we were kind of building something somewhat similar, in, like at the same time. Um, and, you know, Spark kind of emerged and won that. And our product kind of became redundant at that point. Um, so this startup I was working for kind of came to an end. And I'd spent all this time learning about building database infrastructure. And I thought it was really cool. I was having a great time. Um, so that came to an end and I wanted to carry on learning. And also at that time, I just started learning Rust, which I thought was like a really interesting language. Um, so when this job came to an end, I figured, well, I'm going to just go build some stuff in my spare time. I want to learn Rust. I want to learn more about databases. But then I had the crazy notion, oh, why don't I try and build something like Apache Spark in Rust? Um, which turned out to be like an overly ambitious thing to try and do, but that, that's kind of where it all started. No, I, I love that. So uh, you're definitely making me uh, relive some of my past with the database sharding concepts. Like I still remember trying to do a similar concept with SQL Server itself, like Microsoft SQL Server. So that was that was interesting. Let's just leave it at that. And then, um, but then I'm curious, okay, so the why Rust at the time? Like, you know, because Rust, I still remember, right? In fact, I actually had old debates with uh, with folks about like, you know, should we be using Rust versus the JVM? And um, like, even back in like, when just Rust was beginning, right? Like the con the idea was sound, but the like implementation was still like unknown. Mm -hmm. So I I'm curious, what made you choose Rust then? So kind of multiple reasons, maybe not all of them that logical, but at this, so I started with Java really early. Um, like in the 90s, before the 1.0 release. So like most of my career has been like JVM based. I mean, I'm just more Scala these days, but you know, still still JVM. Sure, sure, um, yeah. And after, you know, after this company I was working for came to an end and I was looking for a new job, you know, my resume, like 20 plus years in Java, um, you know, I started to get kind of COBOL vibes. <laughs> and I figured, you know, it's like time to start learning something new, kind of freshen up my skill set. And um, yeah, and it's fun going back. I mean, I have I had C++ experience like way back. Um, not not the current modern C++. And I thought it'd be good to get back to a native language. Um, so that's part of the motivation. And like the thing that's great about Java is, is because it's been around for like 20, 30 years, the ecosystem is just incredible. Any library you need to do anything is there. And you know, that's a big reason why so many like data platforms have been built on the JVM. And you know, going back, it was often IO that was really the bottleneck, not the CPU. So the fact that Java isn't the most efficient language didn't really matter so much. Um, but I think that's changed over time as, um, like, you know, IO has got faster. Um, so yeah, so that, like having the native code and not having a garbage collector, those were things that, to me that seemed like a really good fit for data processing, like no garbage collection pauses. Um, yeah, so that's, I guess that's kind of it. And yeah, you're right. Like when early on when I was learning Rust, it was crazy. Like you'd have your code written in Rust, like using Rust nightly. And then like a week later, you have to kind of rewrite your project because like the language changed. It was, um, yeah, definitely, definitely challenging. And then the compiler was not as smart back then either. So the whole kind of borrow checker thing was like much more primitive. Um, so that's definitely, yeah, definitely a problem. Yeah, and, and I found in general, just even the, 
even some of the concepts of Rust itself was actually confusing, right? Mm. I mean, it allows for memory safety, which is amazing, but like, especially back that time, unless you had been just like, as you noted, like a hardcore programmer, people didn't, they may have been able to say the words, but they didn't really understand the context very well, right? Like yeah. what that implied, what that actually meant. Okay, and then you mentioned that you then want to create Ballista because in, in essence, the way I explain people what Ballista is, I said, I said like, okay, well, think Spark to Scala is basically Ballista to Rust, right? Think of it sure. from that standpoint, right? So <clears throat> no, that's that's obviously a very ambitious project, which is great. And, um, but then you deviated a little bit, right? You, I mean, and not really deviate, but you, you've, you, you, is, Ballista is still actually quite active, but I'm like, but then you jumped on and did a bunch of other projects too. So let, which one came first? Was it Data Fusion first, I think? Data Fusion was first and Data Fusion, my, my goal was for Data Fusion to be distributed. And that's where I started out. Um, and so, so the whole story, so I started building this thing. So, you know, basically started building, I wasn't really sure at the beginning whether it was going to be a database or quite what I was doing. Um, but okay. I, and also I built everything in the wrong order. I kind of started with the SQL parser. <laughs> so I kind of started from the front, worked my way back. Um, Cause I didn't know what I was doing. I was still, you know, I was learning about all of this. And like with hindsight, if-, if That's I'm, actually hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I, I learned so much through through these projects. But if I was starting again, I would start off by building like a physical execution plan, just like the ability to actually run a query against data. And then I would work my way backwards to like a logical plan and the, like a, the query front end. But anyway, so I started working on the SQL parser. Um, and then, yeah, so I was building Data Fusion as a distributed thing. And early on, it was very much kind of vaporware and hacky. I had this kind of demo of a distributed query and I, Post, you know, I had my blog, I posted on Hacker News, and it kind of, um, you know, struck a chord. Um, there were clearly a lot of people very interested in something like this, and that kind of gave me the motivation to keep going. Um, so, yeah, I kept kind of working at this, but at some point I realized that I was trying to do too much having a distributed query engine, and I kind of, yeah, I kind of re rescoped the project just to be an in-memory query engine, and that obviously made it like an order of magnitude easier, um, and also easier to kind of attracts contributors to the project it was a little bit more manageable so I kind of put the distributed bit on hold for some time and then eventually as the data fusion was growing eventually I just got the urge I guess it got to the point where data fusion was getting fairly mature and then I thought well no I've got this is this is a great foundation now let me take and have another crack at building a distributed query engine so that's where I started Ballista and again I started out as a you know very small POC I blogged about it put it in Hacker News and again, it kind of like took off It's on the front page. Um, people were interested. So again, that gave me the motivation to keep kind of plugging away at it. Um, and all of this was kind of, you know, weekends, evenings, like hobby time. Um, so yeah, you know, it's pretty slow going, but I just kept chipping away that over quite a long period of time. And um, COVID helped. Um, I had a bit more time on my hands during like 2020, 2021. So that, that was the time where I really kind of got this story over the edge and got it to the point where I could run some real like queries distributed and get some kind of okay-ish performance. Um, so I got it to a certain point. And then, um, you know, it was too much for me to carry on with as like a personal side project. So I was able to donate it to the Arrow project. And there it's, um, I'm no longer contributing, um, but there are a few companies that are, you know, keeping it going. No, that's amazing. Uh, so, so you and I have a very different COVID project. So your COVID project was Ballista and Data Fusion. M my project was Latte Art. So yeah, oh, was slight, yeah, yeah, it's, it's slightly, slightly different. I think more. Okay, but the, the fights on that. Okay. But, that, that, that. but oh, back to Data Fusion a little bit because you know we've been like, for example, even folks like from my team. I'm, I'm at Databricks. If you folks don't know like basically we've been playing with data fusion and we're just noticing the speed of which it's processing is just amazing. And again, I find it hilariously funny that, um, uh, um, I, I find it hilariously funny that you're referring to the concept as like, you went, you went backwards, you built the SQL parser first. So I'm just curious, like from your perspective, did you expect to see data fusion get to the speeds or the performance that you actually like do see now or was was that like the original thought process or was more like as you progressed you realized oh my goodness i can actually get that much more speed out of this sure absolutely so i, I wrote a blog post back in around 2018 when i started this project uh it's called rust is for big data 
Um, and here's another one that was kind of popular in Hacker News. But I wrote in there, so I've been using Apache Spark, and I'm a big fan of Spark. I think it's like, it's, it's an amazing product. You know, but it's built in the JVM, and there are a bunch of things in there to kind of work around the fact that it's built in the JVM. Um, so that's like the code generation, um, the off-heap memory management to avoid GC, which is all great stuff. But I had this, so I wrote about this, so I had this hypothesis that, okay, so Spark's had to have a lot of complexity, some excellent engineering to kind of get to the performance it's at. And I had this hypothesis that if you built something quite simple in Rust, it would probably be as good or maybe even better. So that's kind of, yeah, where I started. Um, and then there's one one of the, I love talking about my mistakes, but one of the mistakes I made when I started this, I was actually building it as a row-based query engine. Um, Apache Arrow wasn't on my radar at the time. I'd heard about it. And I, I guess I kind of knew about like columnar processing and some of the benefits, but I hadn't really, I didn't have the experience using it. So I didn't really um, realize how important it was at the time. Um, but after posting about this project on Reddit and other places, I got some great feedback from the community. Um, like multiple people told me, like, don't build it row-based. You should be doing columnar and hey, take a look at Arrow. Um, so yeah, I refactored the whole thing to use like I'm just using Rust Vec to represent data in columns instead of doing row based, and yeah, oh, it's suddenly like at least twice, twice as fast as it was before. That's cool. Um, and then I started looking at Arrow. There wasn't a Rust implementation, so I kind of, I kind of migrated my my solution into like made it kind of Arrow compliant. And it, it, you know, it was only a, a subset of Arrow, and it, you know, it wasn't that big a project. But I got it like far enough along where I was able to donate it to the Arrow project and have other people involved. And the the Rust implementation of Arrow today is like so different to what I originally contributed. It's like way better. Um, but I kind of got the ball rolling at least and helps you know get other people involved. So that that works out yeah pretty well. And then yeah so if, and then with other people contributing to Arrow, we got things like SIMD support. And yeah, over time the performance just kept you know getting better and better. No, 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 absolutely true. Uh, so you've worked with QP, how like you know oh, uh, yeah. when it comes to some of the Rust Arrow stuff. So uh, we had actually a, a past D3L2 session where we were talking about this, and it was really funny because when he, he and I were having this conversation about why why using Rust, when he was doing it was just like, well, it was my first you know Delta Rust in this case happened to be his first production Rust project. Uh, he's obviously had many production projects before, just <laughs> specifically the first Rust based production project, but. What was interesting about his perspective, is, which is sort of like how you're talking about right now, was this idea that, oh, um, I just wanted you know these features or I just wanted memory safety. I wasn't actually looking for speed. And then it turned out what they were doing was phenomenally faster to the point where they're going, we actually don't need the distribution capability right now because a single core or single machine was actually able to go ahead and pump through all this data in no time flat. So... It's, it's, cool. it's I, I, yeah, I love hearing these stories like this. And then from, and you know, just to overemphasize your point, yes, I'm, I'm a longtime Spark guy myself too, right? And yes, the verbosity of the error messages alone can mm. scare the living daylights of everybody. So I, I, I understand your motivations, let's just say, mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to do this. Um, Oh, there's a really good question, which I actually would love to pose to you right now uh, from Richard Katz um, um, from, um, uh, sorry, from Zoom, sorry. <laughs> For, I'm forgetting which platform I'm looking at right now. So on Zoom, he, he, so the, the, this is directed to you, Andy, which is like, did you ever uh, meet uh, Lee Fesperin? Uh, he wrote the first SQL in, he wrote first SQL in C and then first SQL in Java as well. So uh, I wonder, he's wondering if you actually had a lot to talk about. <laughs> if you, I, I, if you I don't think I have to be honest. No, I, I think so. Oh. Oh, bummer. Okay. Well, oh, sorry, it's always sorry. interesting. Oh, no, it's okay. It's okay. Well, actually, related to that, I'm just curious, because you've mentioned this a bunch of times, which is like, you pose the questions um, in like Hacker News, or you pose the idea projects and idea in Hacker News, pose the project ideas in um, in Reddit, and then what oh, it seemed to blow up because of there. And then from that context, it made sense to like donate, for example, to the arrow to the arrow community, just because you're building a lot of the stuff around Rust, uh, uh, Rust and Arrow, for example, uh, within that context. I'm just curious, like, how do you stumble onto this idea that you would determine a lot of the pro the projects that you're building right now were basically based, uh, they were blow up because of well, all things social media. <laughs> 
Sure. So I guess there's a couple of things there. Like I recognize the like what I was doing essentially, like Rust, there's a, there's like a wave coming along. There's this new Rust thing that's got this like benefit. It can apply to so many projects that we're currently doing in Java and other languages. So I like if I hadn't done this, somebody else would have done it at some point. But I just kind of recognized early on that this would be like such a great fit. So and also I realized that I can't go building like a, a distributed query engine on my own. That's not going to happen. So I just figured I'd start building a community. So I was posting like a like this week in Data Fusion kind of newsletter to Reddit each week or posting back new releases as they came out. And it was just a great way to promote the project, get feedback, um, but also attract contributors to help me build this. Um, yeah, I just, I, I don't know. I just, I think that's a big part of it for me. Like, I, I don't want to just be sitting here in Colorado, just coding on my own on something that doesn't have, you know, that, I mean, it's kind of fun, but I like being part of a community, working with other people. It's just such a great way to learn. Um, and I also enjoy like mentoring people, helping other people that too. I just think it's a really healthy thing. Um, so that's, you know, that, that's part of it. I just naturally tend to work that way. Yeah. I mean, it, it, my limited involvement, limited, short time, limited involvement with the Arrow community is, it's very obvious that you are, you are shepherding folks. So many f people in terms of being able to build better projects, better products and things of that nature. And that's really cool. And I, I, I guess the question that I didn't think I was going to ask, but now, but now that we brought it up, let's, let's definitely do this. Yeah. What's, what, what's, what spawned you to do that? Because we, again, we were joking about the fact that you're, we're naturally introverted in the, initially, at least that now you're being extroverted to the point where you're going out of your way to shepherd the community or help community members. I'm just curious, like, what was that transition or how did you transition or why did you transition? Gosh, that's a great question. I don't even know if I know the answer to that myself. Um, and I think I think it's different. I think being extroverted, like on the keyboard, is a little bit different than, you know, being extroverted, like in person with people. It's a lot easier to, um, I don't know, it's definitely easier. Um, but, but probably this journey is probably, I think it has helped me become more extrovert generally. Um, like going back a few years, the idea of appearing on a podcast would have terrified me. Or, you know, standing up at a meetup talk, you know, it, it's something I, I definitely did not enjoy in the past, but now I love doing it. Um, so, yeah, I guess being part of this community and growing a community has helped me on that front. So, so yeah, I recommend that for other introverts out there. Oh, uh, okay. So story time from my, uh, from my perspective, I used to remember how, um, so I, I was part of the SQL Server community for the longest time. And so um, we had this big conference called PASS, uh, uh, Professional Association SQL Server. The only reason I bring that up is because that's actually my introduction to social was people were tweeting a lot, right? And, but I didn't want to go to the events because that meant I would actually have to hang out with people. So, so, I mean, I would go to like, like specifically, like I'll ask, uh, ask, ask questions office hours because, you know, I, I didn't mind answering when it was very specific to like, okay, let's go into the internal SQL server. Oh, okay. No problem. <laughs> right. Let me, let me explain that stuff to you, but like, oh, how's your day? Uh, no, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to answer that question at all. That That's just, that's just really weird. Um, and so what I end up doing was I end up not going to sessions, but I end up tweeting. So it was okay. like, so people basically, here's the secret, y'all. For, for a while, people thought I was there. I was just at some other event. And all I did was tweet from the comfort of my sofa. That's, so that's how I got into it. And then finally, actually, because it's like, maybe I should go see these people. <laughs> As opposed to just tweeting from the behind the scenes so that I, I so I, I get it like from from a one fellow introvert to the other introvert which again especially coming from me people don't believe what I just said but the context is yes I definitely understand that context and so you spend a lot of time um a, a small chunk of your time obviously working with the community and um and working with the community to basically shepherd the various projects. Is that what led to what ultimately why you wanted to create Ray SQL then? Was it because just integrate working with the community and recognizing these other projects? Because there's actually a good question about Python versus SQL, which is what, uh, so Python versus Rust, excuse me, which is why I wanted to actually jump into the Ray SQL discussion. Oh now. yeah, sure. So, so like once these, I haven't been that as involved for a while now in data fusion in the community. Um, so I started this in 2018. I, yeah, I was working on it for like four or five years. More recently, I'm doing this. I'm kind of still doing the releases, um, but I'm kind of less hands-on. But with Ray SQL, I was looking to kind of do a little bit. So 
I figured I don't have like so much time to contribute now. And the project is so active. I can't even keep up with the PRs, you know, it's just, it's, it's growing too big. So I was thinking like, how can I, how can I help now? And I figured one way is to do this bit of evangelism and just kind of show people what you can do with data fusion. And um, also over the last couple of years, I realized how important Python is. It's something that I just kind of missed earlier. Um, like Rust is amazing, but Python is the language for data science and data engineering. So I was trying to learn more about that area and I discovered Ray and I did the Ray kind of hello world one like one Saturday morning and like within an hour, like I've got hello world working distributed. I figured, well, I can I can make this into a distributed SQL query engine. So I just kind of stole some stole some code from Ballista. Um, because Ballista already has all the parts. You can serialize a query plan into protobuf. Um, and Ray would let me just send that protobuf to a worker node. Um, so pretty quick and data fusion had Python bindings. So within a weekend I had, I was able to run, it wasn't really building a new query engine. It's really just running data fusion on Ray. Um, but it's cool. Yeah, pretty cool. And, um, yeah, so I built this thing, tweeted about it and that, yeah, that kind of took off. People were like really interested in that. And hopefully that attracts more kind of Python developers to data fusion because previously it's been very much, um, you know, Rust developers have been the main kind of audience. No, that's amazing. So, okay, so uh, that tells you how much better of a coder you are. So you did this over the weekend, which is pretty sweet for starters. I'm just more, more, more of an obsessive program than a good one. <laughs> no, uh, fair. Okay, okay. Uh, we'll but, debate that later, but that's fine. But that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> um, but the, so what's interesting is okay. So basically, for the users of Python, because a la Ray, you're just like you said that now they're able to leverage Data Fusion and they have distributed queries because of Ray. So mm -hmm. this is pretty cool, pretty powerful, um, and it has got this nice SQL parser. Hence, why they call Ray SQL. I guess let's go backwards a little bit because now let's directly answer. So this is Jonathan's question from LinkedIn. It was like, reasons to use Rust over Python. So, uh, I, and we'll go both ways, by the way. This isn't, um, uh, let's be very clear to everybody that's okay. This is not a Denny's trying to do a gotcha on Andy Grove on Rust is better than Python. This is definitely not doing this. We're going to give it both ways. The advantages of Rust over Python, the advantages of Python over Rust. Like, so that way it's equal, right? Because I think there's, it's definitely true uh, uh, in that type of thing. So yeah, let, well, why don't we start with that? Let's start with the Rust over Python for starters. Sure. I mean, the answer, I guess it's just performance. Like if, if performance is absolutely critical and you want to squeeze like every last piece of performance out, then yeah, go Rust. Um, the downside of that, you know, you've got the compilation times. Um, every time you make a change to your code, you've got to recompile. Um, so that's fine if you're building like a product, a platform. If you're just right, trying to run some ad hoc queries against some data, um, you don't want to be like, it can take longer to compile your code than to run the query. Um, so that's kind of where Python is really attractive because um, you have the, you know, you've got the REPL, you can just, you know, type in Python code and it runs, you know, interactively. Um, so that's amazing. And yeah, sure, there's some overhead there. Um, however, if you're coding Rust code from Python, I think this is kind of a superpower. Um, like the, yeah, sure, you've got, like, I don't even know what the overhead is coding into a, a Rust method from Python, you know, I don't know if it's milliseconds or microseconds, but it's a pretty small amount. So if you're coding a piece of code, that's going to take like a second to run, like there's really no overhead. Um, so yeah, so that, so to me, the benefit of Python is this where you have this kind of interactive case. You just want to try running code and see what happens. Um, it is, you know, it's, it's just incredibly productive and you can start off having a lot of Python code. And then, you know, if you get to a point where there's a certain piece that's kind of the performance is becoming a problem, then you can always just take that bit of code and rustify it and then continue calling it from Python. So um, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the Pyo3 projects that lets you call Rust from Python and vice versa. I've only I've only gone down the path of calling Rust from Python, um, but it's, it's an incredible project and I just love that combination. Oh, absolutely. I mean, when you look at the Delta Lake project, uh, how we started off, that's exactly it. It was it was exactly as you called out the we started with Rust. I, I still remember the old compilation times just to like, like just uh, the hundreds of dependencies or crates that we had to pull in. Right. Um, and so the compile time to run the query like the query itself, like with data fusion was like in seconds or or less, like it was just really, really fast. But the actual compilation time, it was like, 
I think this thing's taking like almost a minute right now for me to fish come up. Now, of course, this is early on, so I, I, we've improved on. But but you get my drift. Like, yeah, we were definitely making some decisions. Like, well, especially when I was the one writing, like not writing the code. Now, I, I don't want to take that away from anybody. Uh, there are much better people like Tyler QP Christian that were writing code. No, I, I meant I mean, I was playing with it and trying to yeah. make sure I understood it. And of course, I would screw it up. But but what I loved about it was just how over time. Basically, because you could go ahead and get Python to go ahead and, and uh, with the Python bindings, it's just like you called out, the speed of which you can go ahead and run those queries now. And now because Delta Rust, you've rustified it, right? It's small. It's really, really tiny. And so like, so we're even running Lambdas with Delta Lake right now just because the thing is tiny. So I, I love the fact that we can do things like that, which makes things super powerful. And so I, I guess the, the context is then now with, Ray SQL, you're basically going the other way, which is basically saying, okay, yeah, yeah, for all you Python data scientists, data engineers that you're running it, but you're basically rustifying because it's using data fusion. Do you feel that there's any other components that also need to like be up and any? Like, in other words, where where do you see the Ray SQL project going? I guess that's maybe what I'm trying to really ask. Oh, okay, sure. So, I mean, the Ray SQL project, it really just is like a, a POC. It's an example of it's like a data fusion example. Like here's how you could run data fusion on a Python distributed platform. Um, so it was really just like a couple of weekends creating this thing. And I had some help, got a contribution from uh, Frank Lewin. Um, he did some great work mm -hmm. to make it more perform and he, he was familiar with Ray. Um, and then like coincidentally, Ray has the way Ray sends data around, it has like some arrow features in there. And the fact that this was dealing with our own native data, there were some optimizations that were possible that I didn't really get into. Um, so yeah, I, I was working this over like two or three weekends, but that was it. That was just a, it was really just a proof of concept. And like here, like this is a cool example of what, how you can use data fusion and particularly the Python bindings. Um, the, so data fusion's Python bindings, um, they haven't really taken off yet. There are some people using it, but I'm trying to kind of promote them more. And one of the cool features now, um, you can use data fusion from Python as like a query planner, and you can then get the mm -hmm logical plan back and access it all natively through Python. So you can kind of walk through the, the operators and um, get information. So if you wanted to build a, a new like SQL platform query engine in Python, Data Fusion gets you all the way to getting like a query plan and then you could write your own code for executing it or translating it to some other library like Pothers, Pandas, PDF, whatever. Um, so I think that's kind of interesting. So yeah, um, thanks to this podcast, a few more people know about that feature. So yeah, maybe maybe people. <laughs> awesome. No, no. I, again, I mean, there's this notion of even when you were talking, forget about no, no, not forget about. Excuse me, sorry. Um, even when we're just focusing on single note processing, right? There's this more recent uh, push by various uh, organizations, which I actually, by the way, agree with, maybe just not the extreme that they do it, is this this concept of medium data, right? As opposed to not everything's big data. Um, right. Certainly, small data, go ahead and use your Excel spreadsheet. That's fine. I'm, we're not trying to debate you on that one. But there is this notion of medium data where a, many of the queries we're running are, in fact, medium data, especially if you can filter them out and to, because to do your data science or whatever else. Yeah. And I guess the con the reason I'm bringing this up is because even just on a single node, we've, we've definitely found data fusion to be extremely fast to the point where we're going, there's no reason really to... Oh, so this is me, by the way, as a... Uh, as a developer advocate, I'm not trying to advocate for, this is not a company position. So just in case anybody wants to legally go ahead and get in my, get in my case, just like it's Andy's talking from his position, not from a legal position here, but we've, we've definitely, like we in the community, Delta community have definitely found data fusion on even just a single node being blazingly fast. And so that's why the, the notion of Ray SQL is like, Hey, now run this distributed, this, this thing's going to be able to, uh, process a massive amount of data in short order. And there isn't much you need to do. Like, just like you just said, like it, you just start off with, do you understand data fusion? Yep. Okay. Well then now prop an array. Now it's distributed. We're done. Next yeah. problem. Literally. Yeah. And so, oh, there's another question from Richard uh, that I think may be interesting is that, have you actually looked at the um, modular AI mojo? Um, they, they basically add a struct to Python and uh, uh, fix. Yeah. I, th I think it looks really interesting. I did sign up. Um, it looks really cool. Um, but yeah, I need to find some free time to experiment with it. But yeah, that definitely caught my attention. 
Cool. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's, it's, I love how the, the system is growing. I think you and I had chatted a little bit about how, when you look at the Rust and Python system, there's uh, like, for example, um, um, Oh my goodness, I just did a brain fart. I hate when I, when I do that. Uh, there are very streaming databases that are out there that are also built on Rust for precisely this reason for speed and performance. So uh, the name is escaping me right, right now. It's actually Frank Mashiri's company, but I forget the oh, name. Materialize. Thank you. My goodness. It's, I think I've been talking about materialized views too long. So my brain, mm -hmm. my brain's for, is for, yeah. I, I, the only reason I wanted to bring that little story up is because I still, back to your JVM portion of it, I still remember we had friendly debates. This is not, not a evil debate. Uh, we were both actually working at Microsoft at the time. So long time ago, um, he would talk about how we're just not utilizing the CPU correctly and yeah. we can eke more performance out of it. I was definitely in the, nah, let's just distribute our way out of the problem. That's it, let's just, nah, we're fine. And so he invariably, of course, went to Rust. I invariably went over to Spark and uh, because our, our natures, right? So he would blog these amazing things, how he could just get this one core to do all of these calculations. And meanwhile, I'm like, I'm going Mr. Spark Boy. I'm gonna distribute my way out of every single problem. I don't care about the what the single, what a single machine needs to go do. And so I thought I won the debate, you know, basically, you know, because Spark is the de facto big data standard. And so here I am talking to Andy Grove going, yeah, no, no, I'm pretty sure Frank won that debate. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I'm definitely a rust advocate now <laughs> at this point. So for precisely that reason, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Well, it's absolutely, you can do so much on a single machine. I mean, like, you know, see like these Apple laptops are incredible. My desktop, I've got like a Threadripper 24 core. This is from like three or four years ago. Um, 128 gig of RAM. I mean, you, you know, I mean, it's kind of a server, really, but you can do a lot on a single node. And if you, if you like, the moment you start scaling to more than one node, things, you know, there's there's a, there's a cost to that. Right. Well. That's the thing people forget. There is a cost for distribution. Yeah. No, exactly to your point. Like I'm using my my M2 right now, uh, and I'm using Llama CPP. The, the, now, obviously, it's it, it's it's not the Llama code. It's the the um, the C plus plus version of it, and they've they've downgraded the, for the quantize for for the uh, LM models themselves. But it's amazing how fast my little M2 can actually go ahead and pump out a l large language models, like something where I'm going. Everybody's been talking about these ten million dollar, like you know, Azure in, or cloud instances to to train these models, or or even to run inferences to these models. And meanwhile, I'm going, yeah, my laptop can actually handle this, no problem at all. It's it's actually hilariously funny because mm -hmm. of the efficiencies that we can actually rip out of a single core. It's amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. And Fr <clears throat> Frank Mascheri was one of the first people to give me feedback on Data Fusion. By the way, he gave me some great advice. Oh, sweet. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, he's a cool guy. I really, really like him. It's a, so yeah. My my apologies to Frank for forgetting the momentarily forgetting the name of his company. Um, yeah, I think we've covered most of the the the, the call outs here. So, uh, I, and I don't think there's any other questions. So, um, I, I guess the one thing I did want to, to sort of finish things up per se is just uh, any like where do you see Data Fusion itself going? Because I mean, I, I, you've called out the fact that you've seen the project grow. Um, it, it, it's basically taken a life of its own. You've got your day job too. So I'm just curious, like, but do you see, are there other wishes? Like, because I guess this is me pointing to folks that try to encourage folks to actually get involved with the data fusion project as well. That's, I guess that's my sort of call out here right now. Sure. So I think, I think where data fusion has been really successful and where it's really taking off is that it's, um, so extensible. It's not so much um, something you'd use as an end user necessarily, because you've got like some other great things out there like Polars, DuckDB. You know, if you're looking just to run a query, then those are, those are great. Mm -hmm. uh, but Data Fusion is really good as a foundation for building new systems, uh, both in Rust and Python now. And that's really where um, a lot of the contributors are coming from. There are, I don't know, I mean, at least a dozen companies building new platforms on top of Data Fusion. Um, so I see. I see that continuing that it is like very extensible. So you can plug in your own like query optimization rules, your own execution, you know, whatever. So that's great. Um, I guess one thing on my wish list is to have better. Um, so you, you, we see all these benchmarks online comparing these different query engines. Um, honestly, like Data Vision, as you said, I mean, it's got really good performance, but it, the, the focus hasn't been so much on having like the very best performance in the industry. That's not really the um the main value of it um but, but i think it'd be good to do a little bit more work in some of these areas so that the you know we do better in some of these benchmarks and i'm sure that will happen over time it's just you know 
um, you know, some someone has to be motivated to put in the the work in those areas. Um, so yeah, that's that. And the Py and again Python. I hope to see the Python bindings grow in popularity and find more use cases. I think that'd be pretty neat. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So okay, perfect. Well, I think that's a good way for us to end today's session. Um, and uh, <laughs> sorry, somebody on Zoom just chimed in. When will Rust be available in Databricks? Yes, yes, we're working on it. <laughs> okay, uh, there is a there is a contingent of people like myself who are very who have been rustified. I think I'm going to start using that phrase, by the way, <laughs> Andy. Uh, so we are, there's going to be more of us. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, not I, Nothing I can talk about yet. Uh, and that's not the purpose of today's session, but I did want to call out that there's a bunch of us who are big, big, big fans of Data Fusion, big, big fans of Rust. And so, yeah, we're, <laughs> we're all here. Um, but Andy, um, thank you very much for uh, spending time with us today. Um, if you want to talk to him more, Honestly, he's online with the data vacation community in the Arab community all the time. So you can find him there, no problem at all. Um, and if you're trying to talk to me, I'll be joining that more often, or you can still find me hunkering down at the Delta Lake communities. So that's pretty much it. So um, yeah, any, any last words, any call outs? Uh, I, there was a good call about your book. So I guess we probably should do a shout out to your book. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks. So yeah, it's a self published book. It's uh, pretty concise, but if you're interested in learning like how a query engine works and has built your query engine yeah definitely it's a, a good intro so thanks for that and yeah thanks Danny for having me this is uh it's been great awesome Andy thank you very much for your time I'll make sure to post your book actually with the with the session so that way everybody can get access to it um that's it thank you very much have a thank good much. one take care